and her makeup yeah. turned green. go green mm -hmm. and then you don't have to touch it for the rest of the event. Okay. I'm going to make a go. and make that go green. You don't have to touch it for the rest of the event. I'm going to...
Okay, perfect. I'm turning on my mic. Everybody. Yeah. Let's make it work. Stop, stop making jokes. <laughs> How you doing? Thanks for, thanks for coming. Oh, sure. Okay. And it's turned, you turn it back into a PowerPoint or so. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for coming this afternoon to the Stimson Center for the launch of Zeb Hogan and Stefan Lovgren's book, Chasing Giants. Uh, I'm Brian Eiler. I'm the director of the Stimson Center Southeast Asia program, also our energy and water sustainability program. And it's a distinct pleasure to be able to introduce this panel, a panel of friends, uh, and getting to have you all here at the Stimson Center. Um, this book is, there, there's so much I want to say, and I, I could probably give my own talk about it, um, <laughs> but I'm not going to. We have the authors here okay. to do that. Uh, but it's, it's an amazing global search for the world's largest freshwater fish. Uh, and Zeb and Stefan go all over the world in search of, of that fish. And whether they find it or not, I'll, I'll leave it to, to Zeb and, and the team here to, to talk about that. Um, but it's, it's both a lot of fun in this global search. You know, they're out there getting stuck in the mud and quicksand um, and putting themselves at risk at, at times. Um, they are um, they're defending against giant wasps in the Amazon uh, as they're looking for, um, what's the, the fish, the per, parima? Did I get that right? Parapima. Say it again. Arapaima. Arapaima or the Piraiba. Okay, yeah. Both. Which we will learn more about today. <laughs> you kind of combine both of them. Um, and, and then also, um, there's this part where I laughed out loud when I read it where Zeb is... Um, he says I, he wanted to feel what it would be like to get electrocuted by a giant electric eel. <laughs> you know, wow. Um, but not only is it fun, but uh, there's a lot of good science in here. Um, you know, they take a deep dive into the, the evolution of some of these mega fish and what made them so great. Um, but importantly also, they talk about the kind of the human science of why humans have targeted large fauna um, like large fish and, and why they're so at risk because of what we have done to them and what we're doing to rivers that are putting them at threat. Um, at, at many of them face extinction, actually. Um, and I hope Zeb and, and I'll talk about mm -hmm. the, these threats today. Um, you know, I'm a Mekonger at heart. Um, and, uh, in, and the book starts in the Mekong, starts with Zeb's experience in the Mekong, and it ends in the Mekong as well. Um, but actually, one of my favorite parts of the book was their uh, studies uh, in Mongolia, uh, looking for the Taiman fish, did I get that right? Which is a trout, one giant of the trout. giant largest trout. trout. Yeah, amazing. Uh, and, and just the way that the, the, the Zeb and Stefan make this experience in Mongolia very accessible to, to give you the feeling that you're in big sky country. You're in this, this, this free space uh, of nature and experiencing the rivers and experiencing kind of the habitat of, of the world's largest trout. It's just a fabulous part of the book. Um, I've got a lot more to say, and we're going to come back to this during the discussions. Uh, but before we hand this over to Zeb and Stefan to talk about their book, we've invited a very good friend of, of mine and of our programs at the Stimson Center and of, of Zeb as well, uh, Dr. Mary Melnick, um, who leads the Asia, uh, the environment program at USAID Asia here in Washington, D.C., uh, and has a deep history with Zeb uh, and his work, and, uh, and hopefully we'll learn more about that here. But we're going to have Mary deliver some introductory remarks, uh, and then over to Zeb and Stefan to talk about their books, uh, as well as to Michelle Team then, um, who will um, talk about the WWF's work in this space. And Michelle Team, uh, another very good friend of the Stimson Center of our program, is the freshwater lead for WWF United States, and um, it's just a great group of a great group of people here. We've got some great friends that work mm -hmm. on rivers and fish uh, here in the audience too. I can't wait to hear from you with your questions as well. But Mary, over to you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Brian. It's a great pleasure to be back at Stimson finally for this giant event, if I may say so. 
And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Zipson Center for your outstanding work on the conservation of the Mekong River system. It's vitally important. And, and on behalf of USAID, I'd like to recognize the Stimson Center's collaboration on Mekong safeguards, as well as the, the support you've given to us through the Wonders of the Mekong Project uh, with Zeb uh, as co-lead with Sudeep Chandra here, and, and the contributions that Stefan has made uh, to build public awareness on the issues here. Um, I've had the great fortune of traveling to the Mekong system with Zeb, Stefan, and Sudeep to, to, to really see the many wondrous aspects of it, from thousand-year-old canals still being used today by fisher folk, traditional fishery systems as well, and just the length and the breadth of the Mekong. In Cambodia alone, it has been truly amazing. And the wonders of the Mekong Project has very much benefited from the long collaboration between Zeb and, and Stefan on tracking down these giant fish. Um, you know, Zeb and Stefan, big congratulations on this giant book. Um, I'm, I'm sure, you know, you'll continue to raise awareness across the globe about the importance of these species. Now, one thing I'd like to flag about the importance of this book is that it weaves science and storytelling together to motivate all of us to conserve these important freshwater ecosystems and to care about them and to do something about it in what we can with our own voice and actions in our, our professional lives. As I said, Wonders of the Mekong has really benefited from this approach and it takes um, three key object, uh, actions. One, it continues the research of these wondrous species in the Mekong. It builds local capacity to continue that research and to continue elucidating what's under the water. And then finally, it builds heavily on the outreach. And, and I think probably many of you have read Stefan's articles in the National Geographic. And then if you join Facebook and Wonders of the Mekong, you'll see where there's students even posting about the great wonders of the Mekong. So as I said, we've benefited greatly from that and it's one of USAID's most successful programs. So thank you for that. Now, there are similarities between the book and the wonders of the Mekong. Local communities and local scientists figure very prominently in both books and wonders of the Mekong. And I wanted to flag the importance of these local partnerships. Because of these local partnerships in the science of Zeb, Sudeep, and, and the news and information from Stefan, and even from Brian, you know, the, the collaboration, um, sometimes they work together and contribute to articles. Um, we're all becoming more and more aware of this underwater, undercover world, right? Freshwater ecosystems. So this, now we're beginning to understand the secrets of this world. And I want to flag for you, as a big fan of tigers and snow leopards, that these stingrays and giant catfish are equally important as the tigers and snow leopards are for their own habitats. So, so why should we even care about these big fish, besides them being absolutely amazing and big as me? That's incredible. So really, let's focus on the numerous crises the world is facing today. These crises require us to be extremely efficient because we have few human resources and financial resources to address them, specifically the biodiversity and the, the climate crises. So how can we develop actions and programs, speaking with the USAID hat on, that has multiple benefits? And, and certainly the type of work that Zeb, Sudeep, and Stefan have been doing from raising awareness and having all of us understand how important the freshwater biodiversity is, um, but it contributes saving these giant fish, whether they're in Asia and the Mekong or in the Amazon, is really about saving healthy ecosystems and protecting those ecosystems. And by doing that, we're conserving biodiversity. We're also addressing the climate challenge in both the resilience aspects, because healthy ecosystems provide buffers to shocks. And I think we'll, we may see that. I don't know what your presentation is, but I think you know, we'll be talking about the resilience of the systems. But also, under Wonders of the Mekong, they're beginning to uncover the carbon and methane values of these freshwater ecosystems. 
So we hear often about blue carbon and coastal ecosystems, but we're learning from the project about freshwater um, emissions and what happens when infrastructure comes in and perturbs the systems and what that does for climate change and emissions. So, so um, also, in addition, these fish are very important culturally across Asia, and we need to recognize that. So by conserving um, the Mekong, we're conserving healthy ecosystems, and as Brian often points out, you know, 60 million people are dependent upon the Mekong for their food. And that system it only remains alive if we have all the species, the giant ones, and what is the smallest, 10 centimeters, was it, the smallest? Five centimeter fish. We need to conserve the whole ecosystem. Now, these fish that provide such an amazing awe, and I think, you know, one of the articles from last summer with this giant stingray, you say we had 100 million people looking at these stories. So these fish have the potential to unite diverse stakeholders from the local level to the global level and across national boundaries in the Mekong for conservation action. And I think that's our goal and, and that's really a huge achievement of where you all have been taking this. So in the end, this isn't about catching the biggest fish. It's really about the connections between humans, water, and fish and that these wonderful creatures really can unite us and make our world a better place. So with that, I'll say thanks and congratulations again. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Mary. Mm -hmm. and Mary, I'm glad you, you brought up the 100 million number. You know, I was uh, in December, um, I was in the office of Dr. Heng Kong, who's the director of the Fisheries Research Institute in Cambodia, and he turned to me and said, you know, that story of the giant stingray was, was seen by 100 million people all over the world. And I'm like, yeah, you know, that's, that's the power that you're talking about. And to have him um, say that to, to me, and I think, Zeb, you were on the call as well, it's, just, it's, it's so powerful to see um, what a story like this can happen. At the same time, my grandmother called me about that too. <laughs> so, you know, it's, 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 it's again, the, the power of, of, of media uh, on these finds to, to tell the story and to kind of change the tide. And I think um, Zeb's and Stefan's book talk about the changing the tide on how we view large animals and, and how we uh, have gone from uh, a position of where we tend to, in the past, kill large animals, mm -hmm. humans do this, to one where we're actively and uh, very fervently trying to save them. That's part of the story of this book as well. Um, but let's turn this over to, to Zeb and Stefan. Quick introduction, Dr. Zeb Hogan wears many hats. Um, he is the host of Nat Geo's Monster Fish. Um, he is the co-lead with Dr. Sudeep Chandra on the Wonders of the Mekong program, the USAID Wonders of the Mekong program. Um, he's on the Faculty of Biology at University of Nevada, Reno, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some other hats. Uh, but it's a, a pleasure to have you here with Stefan calling in um, from Nevada. Um, uh, Stefan is a writer uh, and is published in many different outlets. I would gander saying most prominently in Nat Geo. Uh, uh, and um, we've all three of us have long collaborated on Mekong and freshwater issues for a long time. So it's a great opportunity to have you all here in this room to talk about your book. Over to you guys, Zeb. Great, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. I appreciate everyone coming today. And especially thank you to Brian and Mary and Michelle for participating in this event. I really appreciate it. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background about what we're talking about, these big fish, I have a few slides that I prepared. So this story and in a lot of ways this work and focus on big fish started on May 1st, 2005 uh, when a group of fishermen in northern Thailand that I've been working with uh, for about 10 years already when this happened caught a 646 pound Mekong giant catfish. And news of that catch uh, went around the world uh, and it, when, th when that fish was caught I to myself asked uh, what I thought was a simple question, which was, is this the world's largest fish? Or what is the world's largest fish? And I thought that that question would have a simple answer. Uh, it turns out that it didn't. It turned into a 10-year project writing a book and a National Geographic television series and basically the focus of, of my work as a research biologist. Uh, it turns out that we don't know. Um, what the world's largest fish is. Uh, and I, when the news of that fish went around the world, I expected to hear back from the Amazon and 
the Congo and different places all over the world about bigger fish. And in fact, when I talked to 10 different biologists, I got 10 different answers. So I heard about the biggest fish occurring in South America, occurring in Africa and in Asia. <clears throat> and so that started with the help of the University of Nevada, Reno, and National Geographic and WWF, uh, this scientific uh, adventure to learn to find, study, and protect the world's largest freshwater fish. And this question, the fact that we didn't know the answer to this question, sort of to me, and it still does, signifies our lack of knowledge about these fish, about freshwater, about freshwater biodiversity, and the need to learn more, and also the need for more protection. So it's not surprising that it was, it was coincidental, but it's not, it turns out it's not surprising that this started in the Mekong region. The Mekong, it turns out, I didn't know at the time, or when I first started working there, is home to more species of giant freshwater fish than any river on Earth. There are eight species of fish, freshwater fish in the Mekong that can get over 200 pounds or uh, longer than six feet. And you can see some of them, the world's largest carp, the giant barb, uh, two of the world's largest catfish species. It turns out about half of the world's largest freshwater fish are, are catfish in different parts of the world. Uh, and uh, a freshwater stingray, a giant freshwater stingray. It turns out there are at least three species of giant freshwater stingray, one in Australia, at least one species in Asia, and one in South America. So this question, what I thought was a simple question, you know, if you ask, oh, what's the largest terrestrial animal? You're not going to spend your life trying to figure that out. Uh, we know the answer already. <laughs> and so when I started this uh, research, I thought it would be fairly simple. But I, what I figured out quickly, there are a lot of stories out there that aren't true. Uh, this information about these fish, there isn't very much information. What information out, is out there becomes dated very quickly. And so I've spent uh, the last 15 years or so traveling around to all, many of the big rivers and lakes around the world trying to gather information about these large freshwater fish. And of course, this is not something that happened in a vacuum that I did alone. The model for the project is every location, meet with local fishermen, local scientists, and learn from them. Because in many cases, in almost all cases, um, I knew very little about what I was going to find when I went to these different locations. And so um, I learned from uh, fishermen and scientists and local people um, on every continent uh, except Antarctica, and these are just examples of some of the teams from Bhutan and Russia, Florida, Nicaragua, the Amazon, uh, Guyana, some of the teams that helped with this work to learn about these amazing creatures. So what did we learn? It turns out, I thought uh, when the project started, there may be about 20 species of freshwater fish that can get over six feet long or weigh more than 200 pounds, bigger than Mary. Uh, <laughs> Quite a bit bigger than Mary. <laughs> um, and now, after 15 years of, of studying these fish, the list has grown to maybe 35 or 40 species of fish that can get that large. So, um, you, you know, as we learn more, uh, the number uh, gets larger and larger. This is uh, one of the largest fish of South America. There's still some debate that maybe this might be the world's largest freshwater fish. It's an arapaima, an air-breathing arapaima uh, that sur has to surface um, to breathe uh, air uh, from the surface. And so if actually if it stayed underwater, it would drown. It's kind of an unusual adaptation to living in low oxygen environments. Uh, the giant uh, short-tailed river ray, this uh, sort of signifies our lack of knowledge about these species. I don't think there's been a, any formal study of the giant short-tailed river ray. It's probably the largest fish in South America. And I haven't seen a single published study about it. So it just goes to show how little we know about a lot of these species. Uh, these species are important to people, primarily for fisheries, for food, culturally, but also in some places for sport. This is the uh, fish Brian mentioned. This is the world's largest trout species, the taimen, that can get up to six feet long weigh more than 200 pounds, or about 200 pounds. And in Mongolia, it's the focus of a catch and release uh, fly fishing industry or ecotourism. And so Mongolians and international people come from all over the world to fish, uh, catch and release this giant trout that likes, when you fish for them, you need to use these big uh, 
things that look like squirrels, basically. <laughs> and you cast the squirrel out, the fake squirrel, and uh, see if you can get a big, a big trout. So we had a project, Sudeep and I had a project in Mongolia. Uh, we, we go back every year, but we had an um, uh, IMF-funded project uh, for five years from 2004 to 2008, where we were working with our Mongolian counterparts to learn about the, the giant trout. <clears throat> and then another thing that's become clear, and uh, sadly, as conservation biologists, when you've been um, doing something for 20 years, this can happen, but this is the Chinese paddlefish, uh, a species of fish that lived in the Yangtze, could get up to 20 feet long, probably 500 pounds, and it's the first one of these species to be declared extinct. So I went to China for the first time looking for the Chinese paddlefish, I think in 2000 or two, 2007 or 2008. Met with Chinese scientists there who we went out on surveys together. And the fish was probably gone. Uh, it was officially declared extinct in 2020, I believe. But it was probably gone when we were looking for it in 2007 or 2008. So that's sad and what we're trying to avoid. Uh, and then also, I think, a take-home message from this work is that if you look, you know, not, this work, a lot of this work was sponsored by National Geographic, and National Geographic has people that climb the highest mountains or dig in the earth for clues about the past or look into space. And my interest was always looking at this hidden world that Mary talked about underneath the water. And one of the take-home messages is that if you look, and this also happened with Wonders of the Mekong, if you look it's amazing what you'll find. I mean, I think a lot of this information that has come out of the project is simply because somebody was looking. And looking somewhere where people don't usually look. You know, under, underwater it's very difficult to study these big fish that live in remote areas in murky water a lot of the time. And so a lot of these amazing discoveries are a result of, of the, all these people making the effort to for one of the first times to look and see what's living down there. This is the, a gooch, a species of catfish in the Himalayan foothills that can get up to about 10 feet long. It also occurs in the Mekong. And so what are some of those amazing discoveries? Uh, this the photo on the left is with an electric eel. Uh, when we were uh, filming with one of our National Geographic shows, we were with some scientists down in Brazil. They measured the voltage of an electric eel and actually were able to describe a new species of electric eel based on, and I'm going to get this wrong probably, based something about the shock. I don't know if it was the, it was a very powerful shock, but something was unique about the shock that this electric eel created that allowed scientists to, de to describe a new species of electric eel, which is pretty cool. And then the photo on the right is a rediscovered species, the giant salmon carp. Uh, that was feared extinct from the Mekong and last year uh, was found again in northern Cambodia. Um, it's a species that can get up to six feet long, over 100 pounds, and luckily, I mean, it's very close to extinction. We thought it was gone. We thought it might be another one of these species that we lost, but luckily it was rediscovered and now we're trying to figure out a way with our Cambodian colleagues to learn more about it, to try to find more of them, to see if it's still out there. It, this hopefully wasn't the only one, the last one. And then because Sudeep and Mary always give me a hard time, because I'm always talking about big fish and never little things, I got a text uh, yesterday that our team in Cambodia uh, discovered a new species of tiny crab. Uh, and this was a part of our fisheries work, but I guess the crab ended up in one of the nets. Um, and they sent me a email yesterday, new species, and they're going to name it after the winners of Mekong Project. Uh, uh, I don't know what, I'll send you the name, but, <laughs> <laughs> but basically the crab genus, I forget what the crab genus is, and then uh, basically Latin for river of wonder or something like that. So that was very nice tech, text to get yesterday. Um, yeah, so the world's biggest creatures and some of the Tiniest, that crab looks minuscule. Uh, and then another final take home is that, you know, why are these fish important, these big fish? Um, they're indicators of river health. And one of the main results we've seen from Wonders of the Mekong is there's a very close relationship between the status of these big fish, 
the status of freshwater biodiversity overall and fisheries productivity. So in all of our studies, almost all of our studies, we see a very tight relationship. When we see biodiversity go down, which a lot of times these big fish are the first ones to disappear, fisheries decline in tandem with the biodiversity. So we're protecting these big fish for, because they're amazing creatures, also for uh, the river, keeping the river healthy, and ultimately for ourselves who depend on the rivers for clean water and fisheries and all kinds of stuff. So as Mary said, ultimately, although I did write a book, Stefan and I spent over 10 years writing a book about the search for the world's largest freshwater fish. It's not only about the search, um, it's also about uh, wonderful rivers and the people who, who depend on them. So this work would not have been possible without many people, support of many different organizations over the last, the last 15 years or so. So I um, would like to thank Mary again, Brian, and Michelle. Michelle and I have known each other since uh, 1993. <laughs> uh, she was my boss uh, as an undergrad. Um, so thank you so much for your support for almost, I can't do math, 30 years now. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much. And I'm going to uh, turn it over uh, quickly to Stefan, or maybe Brian, you'll Correct. turn it to uh, Stefan, uh, the co-author of the book and someone who's been many, uh, uh, on many of these adventures and research projects all over the world. Great. Great. Thank you. We got gotcha. you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you for my for my 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 uh, 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 I think this story is connecting to the strong rock case. It's super exciting. I'm super excited about the fish. Uh, and I didn't find the fish. But I didn't know that it was going to rain 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 rain. But I like my question. And then he was asking about the fish. Uh, 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 but I, I like my question. And then he was asking about what is the world's world largest fresh water fish. And it was uh, sort of a uh, journalistic uh, you know, story for me. I feel the simplicity of my question. And, uh, and so. The question of what is the world's largest freshwater fish became sort of a natural jumping off point for this story. It was a mystery. And I like my So, uh, to me, it was a fascinating story because he's this hard answer. Megafon was about to see the teeth on the door, and uh, it was an important story because of the uh, conservation crisis and the difficulties that these fish were in. And, uh, and just like I said, talking about uh, uh, being surprised that so little is known about these fish, I was surprised that uh, there hadn't been anything written about them. Uh, and uh, yeah, some years later, later not to write, I needed someone to, to, to write their uh, uh, the descriptions for, for, for animal species that they have. Uh, and uh, and uh, so they asked yeah, me to write yeah, these descriptions yeah, for large yeah, fish. Yeah, and yeah, I realized yeah, that they did that because there was no one to do anything about big fish uh, at National Geographic or sports. They were interesting. Uh, also, uh, uh, was that they, they, this was a really, you know, the bigger spend a bit about that and uh, 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 about this and, and, and Michelle will, uh, I'm sure, talk, talk about this as well. There was, you know, bigger story about the fresh water issues. Uh, but these big fish were particularly vulnerable because of, uh, you know, a whole host of movements and overfishing and, and uh, dams and, uh, and we start threatening to the health of the river as a whole as well. So it will be fish in trouble, the river is in trouble. And, uh, and this is something that, uh, you know, lends a way to the story and something that we want to write 
for how to uh, do the same thing in, in other parts of Baltimore and, and beyond uh, around the world. So, um, you know, this, this additional and, and by extension, the story about how our rivers and lakes and wetlands, you know, it's, it's price cycle, but, but also, uh, you know, reports on these possible stories from the negative months that, you know, they sort of want to provide hope and, and, and point to solutions for how to improve things. I think that's really important and then I'll continue what we might want to do with this book. Um, plus, of course, we might not find these additional work. And we do many. Thanks, Stefan. So, uh, thank you for those remarks. Thank you. Thank you. There was some, just a technical note, there's some um, audio issues. So check out the chat from our team on maybe ways that we can improve audio for the latter parts of the, the event. But thank you for those remarks. Um, and for those of you tuning in, if you want to ask questions to Stefan or Zeb uh, or Mary or Michelle, um, go to stimson.org slash questions and you can submit questions and they're going to magically pop up on this iPad here for me to ask to all of you. And we'll be doing that soon. Um, but now over to Michelle Team, uh, who is the freshwater lead for WWF US. Um, but she's really a global ambassador for free flowing rivers. And a lot of what I know uh, and the work that we build into our work about promoting free flowing rivers comes from Michelle and her team. So it's a real pleasure to have her here. Um, it's also a pleasure to learn about your history with Zeb um, and your, in your research collaboration uh, in this book. And maybe we can get into that in a bit. Um, but Michelle, over to you with your work at WWF. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for all that Stimson Center is doing, especially on the Mekong. Um, I'm Michelle Team. I'm with WWF in the US. And my work has always been about rivers. And that's how I met Zeb so many years ago. Um, and he said I was his boss, but he taught me everything I know because he had been working with a previous grad student <laughs> on the same fish that was my study fish. And I think it's pretty ironic that both of us um, did, our, did that work together below a dam. And uh, I think in a lot of ways it's informed and made the kind of nugget of the impression that's shaped my career in many ways um, and probably yours too. So yeah, I'm just going to offer a few reflections. Uh, this is the North American paddlefish, one of the great giants of, uh, found here in the US. And um, I'm not going to speak very long. I'm going to talk really from the global policy perspective. And this figure is probably familiar to many of you. Stefan, thank you for your comments. You kind of alluded to it already. but. Um, what really strikes you when you look at this graph is, this is from the WWF's Living Planet Report. You know, on average, marine and terrestrial species populations have declined around 36 to 38 percent globally. Freshwater is, species are the ones that are really pulling that curve down. They've declined by about 83 percent since 1970. And so, yeah, why, why? Why are we not paying more attention to these? That's always the question, right? And it's not just about the species. Um, it's about the habitats, of course. But it's also about the cost to society, not only in terms of the economic costs, but also the social and cultural losses that come with loss of, of these species and these systems. And we know, I'm not going to read through these statistics, but looking towards the future, it's going to get worse. <laughs> uh, climate change is here. It's already happening. And we're, we're seeing those impacts. And the impacts are hitting the most vulnerable people the hardest. Um, so with that kind of gloomy start, I wanted to actually share a few kind of more hopeful insights about what's happening on the global policy stage. Um, and the connection back is that I feel like through the work of Zeb and Stefan and others who are really raising up the mantle about freshwater biodiversity and beating the drum that there is this life within our waters that is forgotten, that there is change that start, there's starting to be this shift in global policy implementation. And 
Um, so the two things that I wanted to mention was, and some of you who are in the room or on the phone may have been at these meetings um, in December in Canada was the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity Conference of the Parties where the governments came together to agree on the next, it was supposed to be 2020 to 2030 <laughs> global biodiversity framework, but given the pandemic, it's now for uh, up until 2030, but starting now, uh, for countries to commit to targets. And you can clearly see in targets one, two, three, and 11, inland waters is explicitly called out now. And that's a huge deal to have that uh, global level framework for policy around freshwater protection and conservation and restoration. So, and that happened because of the voices like Zeb and Stefan's, but also we had some, a lot of indigenous activists and local communities raising up their voices about the importance of freshwater systems. Groups like TNC and IUCN and Wetlands International and WWF and others, the scientific community came together and put out a science brief going into CBD about the need to include these targets. So just kind of the message is we all need to do this together to make the difference and that's part of what is hopeful. Another um, recent development a couple of weeks ago was the UN Water Conference in New York and about 10,000 people gathered in New York City for the first time that the UN has had a conference focused on water in 46 years. Um, w let's hope it's not two more generations <laughs> before we have that next water focused conference. But one of the things that came out of that was a country uh, led initiative on the freshwater challenge, which has explicit targets about freshwater restoration, um, both rivers and wetlands, and quantitative targets by 2030, which is really linked to target two of the GBF that I just spoke about. So those are a few kind of hopeful notes that I wanted to share connected to the message that I think Zeb and Stefan have brought around the plight of these mega fish and freshwater biodiversity as a whole. With that. I'll hand it back Thank to you. Thank you, Michelle. All right, well, I've got some questions for all of our panelists. Um, and it's gonna, it's gonna come right back to Michelle and, and to Zeb. Um, to the moment that, that you describe where you're collaborating together 30 years ago, um, here in the US, I believe. Um, and uh, and it's, it's a, it's, it has to do with a dam. I'm kind of teeing you up to relate the story <laughs> to us in a bit. Um, and uh, it's not about a dam being um, torn down. Um, but it's how a dam can be utilized to restore. Um, and something doesn't happen very often, but I think there was an experiment that happened um, to see what we could learn from, from that. Um, could you talk about that moment of, of your careers, um, you know, what that meant, what you learned from it, and then also uh, speak a bit about how in the United States we are beginning to dismantle old dams uh, and what the power, that, uh, of how that restores nature and brings back the power of nature. I hope both of you can yeah. contribute to this answer. Uh, so Michelle and I uh, met each other working for, and correct me when I mess this up, uh, but the US Fish and Wildlife Cooperative Research Unit. Uh, so it was based at the University of Arizona. I was an undergraduate ecology major, and Michelle was a, a master's student. And our kind of overall objective or job was to do native fish surveys in the tributaries uh, that flow into the Colorado River in Grand Canyon National Park. And Michelle, in particular, I think, was working in, on the Priya River mm -hmm. uh, with a species, native species called the flannel mouth sucker. <laughs> and what Michelle alluded to was that our research site was 14 kilometers or 14 miles? Kilometers. Kilometers. Yeah. We were, I just remember 14K. Uh, we were 14 kilometers downstream of Glen Canyon Dam. And the river below Grand Canyon Dam uh, is, runs perf crystal clear, uh, 
volumes of water coming out of the dam, at least back then, would fluctuate wildly during the day because of electricity generation. And the native fish were not gone, but doing very poorly uh, because of all the changes uh, uh, from the dam and also from invasive species. And so what Michelle, or, yeah, what Michelle alluded to was our experience seeing how the native fish were gone and were struggling, and yet were actually doing pretty well in the tributary that was still flowing naturally and functioning the way that it did historically, I think was a big um, learning uh, experience for both of us. I learned, personally, I learned about endangered species issues. I learned how difficult it is to fix a river once you build a thousand foot tall dam or however big Glen Canyon Dam is. And uh, we also were part of large scale uh, kind of manipulations or efforts to at restoration through at what at the time Bruce, I think it was Bruce Babbitt, but um, they started initiating controlled floods that would release pulses of water out of Glen Canyon Dam to mimic natural flows. And so we had all these fish tag and uh, we would, we sat, I remember, Michelle doesn't remember this, but I remember sitting on the bank as they, as they cranked up the releases of the dam and we watched the river come up and then I think it was Michelle's, one of Michelle's jobs to figure out what the fish did yeah. after that. I think they all fled into the tributary. Yeah, I mean the thing that was really cool in that, that particular experiment is they put dye, they put red dye in the water when they, because they wanted to track individual particles, what they did going downstream. And so we could see the wave of red coming through. And it was a particularly high water year, so they ran the, the dam high for much of the spring and summer. And what was really interesting, and actually what I ended up publishing on instead of what I, my actual research question was, was that we found young of year of this particular threatened species um, reproducing in the mouth of the Perea because the water coming in from the Perea was warm and the water from below the dam was really cold. So there was this little refuge. When they ran the, the dam high enough, the water coming out enough was there to create this pool. It created a nursery ground. So I think, yeah, and to, back to your main question, I think there are, and that, this is the whole idea behind environmental flows uh, below infrastructure like dams, is that you can sometimes operate them in ways that mitigate some of their impacts, which is kind of what we saw with that. But that was a pretty unusual year because it was a really high water year, so there was flexibility to run it um, differently. And that gets into some of the work that we're doing with the, the dam monitor. And, and Deb and Stefan, I have to thank you for giving a shout out to the impact of the dam monitor in the book. Um, with the Mekong Dam Monitor, we're seeing ways and actually suggesting ways for operators, including those in China, during these, these kind of flush years of water, um, that those dams could let out more water to promote the pulse downstream. Because those, especially the ones in China, they're the big ones that, that mm -hmm. have the most influence over the pulse downstream and the Tomei sap. So they could actually be part of a solution rather than being part of a problem. Um, Mary and Zeb, uh, back to the Mekong uh, and your work in the Mekong. It's, it's not an easy uh, governance space to, to try and make an impact. But with the Wonders of the Mekong program, you have. Um, and I think it's a, it's a testimony to um, you know, how US government resources and talent from US institutions and, and universities can come together to, to work in a complex space. Right, um, where um, there are governance challenges um, they, in, in, in countries where we might not necessarily be you know, best friends with, right? have the best bilateral relationship. Um, so my question is, is, you know, how, is, how can science and science collaboration like this work to promote um, bilateral relations with countries that are difficult to work with? Because you know, you, in the book you mentioned Mongolia as well, kind of. Um, having a political backslide when you, when you were there as well. So science and fisheries work, you know, is this, what role does it play uh, for our foreign relations with other countries? Yeah, please. Yeah, thanks, Brian. It's a very important question. I think um, 
fundamentally on the topic and how we addressed it, the vision and the approach. Just look at the title. It was Wonders of the Mekong. It wasn't Don't Kill the Mekong, right? So, so we recognize that we have a common objective and that we value the system for certain things. Um, you, you know, for local communities and the national economy of Cambodia, they're, they're highly dependent upon um, the fish and the fisheries. And so how do we begin to highlight this extraordinary resource? So we approached it from a very positive win-win. We have similar objectives. And then because there's a lack of data and basic scientific data on the issue, it's a real opportunity to work together and find out what is out there. Or to put it, uh, you, you know, you can't really speak for the Cambodians, obviously, but it's their research finding out what they have. Mm -hmm. And I think Wonders of the Mekong, Zeb, and Sudeep have been fully supportive of addressing the priorities of the Cambodian Fisheries Research Institute. So the approach was from the beginning to highlight and raise awareness of literally the wonders of the Mekong and to be able to support the national pride in this resource. I, and I think that was perhaps one of the, the approaches. So um, it's very collaborative uh, building of a partnership as opposed to um, any other type of dialogue. So. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, uh, one of the beauties of being scientists is that uh, we operate sometimes, or I, I would like to think most of the time, apart from politics. Right, of course. And so we have our partnerships and collaborations. I first went to Southeast Asia through Fulbright. It's very much the model of Fulbright, um, exchanges, learning from each other, uh, working together for the common good. And I think that, that the whole, this idea of Wonders of the Mekong, that idea sort of pervades the project. So we sort of started with the science. It's built up to be this amazing sort of capacity building, uh, team building exercise. And then the communication products have come out of that that then have had even a, a bigger impact. And so it's really you know building a constituency that can advocate for the Mekong, uh, raising awareness about the value of the Mekong, because then people who are making decisions, I mean, it's, it sort of goes back to these fish as well, like, um, if you don't know it even exists, mm -hmm. you're not going to value it, you're not mm -hmm. going to, uh, it's not going to be part of the decision. And so, one is the Mekong, emphasizing that the Mekong's the most productive river on earth, that people depend on it for fisheries in Cambodia and rice and rice in, Cam in Vietnam, its importance and emphasizing that. It, it, the goal is that it leads to more sustainable um, scenarios and choices. And uh, your work um, has tapped into and amplified something that we've all always known, that like Cambodians know the importance of the Mekong to their society, to their economy, to their civilization, right? It's a kind of an existential issue. That the Mekong needs to thrive for their, their society to thrive. Um, and, um, and we can see that um, you know, it's hard to tie the direct impacts of, you know, wonders of the Mekong work produced this X, Y, and Z um, uh, decision within government. But you look at the, the bevy of commitments that the Cambodian government has made over the last 18 months uh, with dolphin protection, with a UNESCO natural heritage application that's in the works for the Stung Trang flooded forest, with um, a first ever um, closed season for fishing on the Tonle Sap in the way that they did it. Um, and and just a, a real commitment now um, to protect that resource. You know, you know, pat yourselves on the back for for your contributions to that because it's 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 huge, um, and it means a lot. I think for the for the health of the river and for not just for Cambodia, but it, these benefits are transboundary in nature. All right. Well, we're going to um, turn this conversation over to all of you in the audience for questions for about 10 more minutes to keep you for a little bit longer because we've got a reception afterwards and a book signing. Uh, and everyone here, I think, will be able to get a book um, uh, from Zeb. And Zeb's been very kind to bring free copies to distribute. Um, but let's hear from all of you. Please identify yourself when you ask a question. Uh, and uh, let us know to whom you would like to ask a qu question. Kamara. Kamara Sok from Voice of America Cambodian Service. Uh, thank you uh, 
panelists who give a great introduction. I have a question to Zeb and other panelists if we have time. The Cambodian people, they are concerned about no fish anymore in the future. So I don't know what is your finding about that. And also, that's because of illegal fishing and climate change and also the dams, upper streams, uh, water. And also, back to the authority in Cambodia, they also the people concerned, the authority behind the illegal fishers. So uh, uh, did you find anything uh, lately uh, that Cambodia should have a hope on more fish <laughs> in the future? It's a, it's a good question, and it's a very difficult question. Uh, I think one of the bright spots is that uh, the Mekong in Cambodia and the Tonle Sap have been extremely productive for hundreds of years. For you know, th the amount of fish that have has been produced from the Mekong in Cambodia is astounding. You know, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of tons, and that, although you do definitely hear from the fishermen and people on the river that catches are declining, uh, the fishers that we work with are still relatively speaking, catching and consuming enormous amounts of fish. So I think that the worry, there are a lot of different worries. The worry is about illegal fishing and overfishing. There's a worry about climate change, a worry about upstream dams. And I, in a lot of ways, those issues kind of have to be tackled one by one as opportunity allows. But I guess my, my main point is that um, it's not too late. Yes, there are a lot of big challenges, but the, the river is still incredibly productive and it's not too late to address those challenges. So we, we, sh we have seen there is, um, I, I don't know, the, you know, there is, uh, there are governance challenges, uh, but we have seen the Fisheries Administration uh, take some positive steps in, turn in terms of enforcement of particularly damaging fishing gears like electro fishing or bottom trawling. We've seen some uh, enforcement and reduction of those illegal gears. There's been a big push now, um, which actually will have an impact on fishermen in the area, but in the Stung Trang and Crache area, there's a big push now to protect the dolphin in that area. Yeah. So, and Cambodia, the Cambodian government has made some positive decisions about hydropower development recently in terms of pledging to um, stop <laughs> uh, mainstream hydropower, which those two proposed dams in Cambodia, Sambor and Stung Trang, are the, would be the absolutely the most um, damaging dams. So the fact that the Cambodian government, at least for the time being, has pledged to, to stop construction of those dams is very positive. So I think that the the take home message is that although there are challenges and declines, the, the Mekong River and the system is still intact enough to provide and to recover if given the opportunity. Stefan, did you want to add any comment to that? Because you've been writing about this um, intactness and the rebound that, that we saw after that string of droughts in the Mekong. Um, the rebound that happened this last year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's not so great. There's, My cue was a, to test it out. There's a, there's a, there's a lag. Is it is it because we if we turn ours off will it help? Go ahead, Stefan. I'm just curious. One point. One point. That this year, we have some development in the in the south line. Thanks, thanks. Other other questions? Sudi. Yeah. <clears throat> Sudeep Chandra at the University of Nevada and Wonders of the Mekong Project. <clears throat> depending if we can get Stefan's engagement here, but also with Zeb and others. You spent 20 years 
working on these topics, but it's one thing to have the scientific information, but both of you really excel at writing and, and the video capture and the photographs of these iconic fishes and the systems. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how communicating information around science, especially between the writing and the video medium, may have enhanced our abilities to bring attention to fresh water, the plight of fresh water and biodiversity and how that has changed over time. It's just you're exceptional at what you do. So kind of curious of the last two decades, any lessons learned that you might have? One thing, you know, one thing that set wonders of the Mekong apart a little bit is the emphasis on outreach and communication. So I think one of the take home messages is that you have to try uh, because it's actually unusual to have a project, uh, especially, I mean, a science project. This was never meant to be a purely scientific project, but I think even within USAID, it's fairly unusual to have such a large communication component. So just everyone recognizing that that's part of what we're supposed to be doing is that's the huge first step. And I think working with National Geographic, there's that same built-in uh, value to communication and to storytelling that a lot of times as scientists or maybe as policymakers we don't have. So there's just not a kind of built-in, hey, we need to be spending our time doing this. I'll just give one sort of story kind of related to what you're asking. So sometimes it, Stefan has been amazing at um, helping spread the word about freshwater issues, about winners of the Mekong. Sometimes you also get a little bit lucky. So we were fortunate enough to be working with fishermen who caught some very large stingrays in Cambodia this last year. Caught, and then through our project, we were able to tag and release them back into the river. And this one, the one of the stingrays, uh, as it swam away, our outreach coordinator, uh, Chut Chana in Cambodia, was filming, uh, and he just got a, an amazing shot um, amazing shot of the stingray swimming away and then it lifts its snout and sort of waves <laughs> and all the people on all the community members on the riverbank are all saying bye 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 <laughs> and that's the video so we say 100 million it's because one of the it was a it was a big story but National Geographic put it on their Instagram <coughs> excuse me and National Geographic has the largest Instagram following of any organization I believe and so that's one of the main ways that that story really got out there. But it wouldn't have, it was partially luck, I mean, partially because we're committed to doing that, but also partially luck that the stingray swam the way it did and then waved by and everyone was <laughs> waving by to it. Um, and it was just a great video. And you could, it's one of those, it's like a communication piece. And I don't know what Stefan's experience is with this or Michelle's or, um, but you can tell what's going on without any words. like. Mm -hmm. You can watch the video and it immediately makes you feel good. And having those kind of communication pieces is, is pretty rare in my experience, uh, especially with fish. Like we deal with a lot of like dead fish. Um, so having that positive video visual where you could see what was happening and see everyone like so happy and see the fish swim away was, was really good. So that's one of the reasons that it was so popular. And, and with the stingray, uh, that the feeling that you get from watching that video, the connection we have to you know an animal that lives in the water, um, is kind of the opposite of of how large fish like this were portrayed in the past. You think about Jaws, right? And how that you said in the book cleared the beaches uh, <laughs> all over the United States um, in the mid '70s when it came out, um, or even the stingray itself. You describe it as how um, I think in Thailand it's it's. Uh, it's an unlucky fish or something like that. If you see it, bad things will happen to you. So we have these stigma against large fish, but then when you can connect, in, connect to it in the way that that video um, did, it, it tells a very powerful story. Um, we're gonna do two more questions and then we'll conclude and, and please keep your answers brief so we can get through them. Um, <coughs> Peter John Maynell, who's an old river hand and Mekong hand, sent a question and PJ, thanks for tuning in um, to Zeb. What are the top three measures for the protection of these large fish, in your opinion? Oh, globally? Uh, we, we do, and maybe I'm um, biased because of Michelle and I's background, but hydropower comes up a lot. Dams mm -hmm. are a big issue for these fish. They're big fish, often migratory, need healthy, free-flowing rivers, lots of space. 
So keeping some river, rivers free flowing is extremely important. Uh, these big fish are very, uh, they're vulnerable to over harvest. And we also know almost nothing about their ecology or how to protect them. So just off the top of my head, the three things that pop up immediately are free flowing rivers, the importance of free flowing rivers, the importance of basically, uh, I guess I'll combine harvest and science we don't have species conservation action plans. We don't, there's, there's no science on these fish. There's no, we don't have a clear understanding of how to protect them. And so that obviously has to be a first step. Thanks. Now this one is for anyone here. Um, protecting large species, what are the extra benefits or the co-benefits of, of this type of endeavor? What else comes from it? And I think we've talked about it. It, it came in twice here from our online audience. Um, how do we benefit? And how, how does uh, biodiversity benefit from the protection of large species? I, I just very simply, you know, if we can protect, the big fish are the most vulnerable many times. If you can protect the big fish, if you can keep the big fish in the river, most of the time you're protecting the fisheries, you're protecting water quality, you're protecting the natural function of the river, um, the ecosystem services. So because they're the most vulnerable, if you can keep them in the river, it's usually an indication that most other uh, benefits that we get from the river are intact as well. Can I just add to that? Please. I, I think also, I mean, one theme throughout um, today's presentation is the fact of how much we didn't know. We're learning a lot more from the book and the research, but there's a long way to go. I mean, just pointing out that there are no species conservation plans to date. So if you look at the flip side, the terrestrial biodiversity, I mean, there are species conservation action plans, but the point I would like to make with respect to the question is the fact that only now are we beginning to see scientific articles about the value of large mammals for terrestrial carbon. Mm -hmm. And so that's still not known. What is the value of these large fish for maintaining carbon in aquatic freshwater ecosystems. So, so I think there's a lot more we, we don't know and continuing to, to do no harm, conservation will allow us to uncover some of these co-benefits a, a lot more than we know right now. And just to add one example of that, I think, you know, one of the things that's important for a lot of large fish is to access to floodplains and mm -hmm. for reproduction mm -hmm. and other habitats. So, and when we keep rivers and floodplains connected, that also provides a buffering for uh, flood events for humans. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of things right. like that that I think we don't immediately go to in terms of the co-benefits for humans, but that are there. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Zeb, for joining us today. Thanks to all of you for coming to the Simpson Center. Uh, my last thing to say is, Get this book, Chasing Giants. It's a great read. It's story driven. There's good science in here too. You'll learn a lot and you'll probably want to go out and see some of these amazing rivers um, and, uh, and let us know about your adventures. So please join us for our reception. We've got a book signing in the back. Um, thank you again, everyone, for, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. For anyone that needs to leave, don't wait for me to give you a book. Just if you need to leave, please go back.